Today we have a lecture on differential motion. We did forward inverse kinematics and what we are doing there was to relate position from the actuators to the position of the robot's tip. Right? Uh, rotation angles to Cartesian position and orientation or displacement of prismatic joints to Cartesian position and orientation. What about speed? How does the speed of a given joint affect the speed of the end effector of the robot? That's what we're going to see today. Why is that important? Well, let's assume that you want the robot to be positioned in a specific orientation in the body. And then you want the robot at that specific orientation to be able to move in all possible directions. All right? But that is not necessarily the case. There could be configurations. You probably heard the word singularity before. Alec probably... Uh, uh, mention that. Those are configurations of the robot arm in which the robot cannot move in a particular direction. And you can see that through the analysis of um, differential motion you're going to see today. So basically now shifting the focus from position to position to speed to speed and then later torque and force. So the objective of the lecture is to study the concept of Jacobian which is exactly that a relation between um, actuation speed and Cartesian speed of the robot. Find the relation between the joint and end effector speed and the relation between joint torque and end effector force. So here's an example. The uh, robot below was designed to operate on the human eye by filtering out and downscaling the surgeon's motion. If the end effector is to move at a given speed in a given direction, what are the require the speed of each joint. Now we know how to do that for position. Is the speed the same? Well, not, not quite. Here's another example. Partial and total knee replacements are often performed using robot-assisted surgery. If the, robots is, if the robot is to apply a significant force to the knee, what are the required joint torques? In other words, how do you control the direction and the magnitude of the force at the tip of the robot by controlling the torque provided to individual actuators? So let's uh, get right into it. We studied the forward kinematics, and the forward kinematics was the relation between position and position. Right? It's a simple function that you can get from the homogeneous transformation matrices. We input all the variables that we have control of, and the output is the position and orientation of the tooltip or the position of and orientation of any point in the robot, uh, the robot's arm, body. <clears throat> any point in the robot's body. The differential kinematics is uh, some sort of similar analysis, but now we are relating joint angular speeds to the position, the speed of the end effector. So if you call here uh, the position of the joints theta, and the position of the prismatic joints d, theta dot, and, and the prismatic joints d dot, the output will now be the time derivative of the, um, the uh, homogeneous transformation to some extent. We can also use what you're going to see today to relate now the torques and forces applied by prismatic or revolute joints to the force and torque applied by the robots and the factor on its uh, environment. All right, so let's do an example. Let's just start with an example. It's probably the easiest way. We have this two dot planar arm in, with two revolute joints, and you have the forward kinematics that we calculated before for that robot arm. It depends on theta one and theta two that you can see here is one, here is the other one and on the length of each arm. So if you want to relate position to position, we know how to do that. Now if you want to relate speed, then you're talking about a differential amount of position change. A small change in position, which over time would characterize the speed. So if we apply a very small change in position, how does that affect the how, uh, what change in position does it create at the tools and the factor? You would say, well, that's simple. Just take the derivative 
of the forward kinematics with respect to all degrees of freedom. That is theta 1 and theta 2 because those are the two that can change the position of the end factor. So if you take the derivative of this equation with respect to theta 1 and theta 2, then there we have it, uh, our first insight into how these relations would, uh, would occur. But before we go and take the derivative of this expression, let's just do a generic derivative that now takes a, a small uh, this, uh, change in displacement. Let's, let's call that a small displacement d theta. Now we're applying a d theta 1 and d theta 2 to each of joint, which is equivalent to now calculating the effect of that uh, small theta on xe and y uh, and xy, which is the position of the robots and the factor. Let's consider first uh, the x, x uh, the change in position in the x direction. If you apply a small, if you take a, a derivative with respect to theta 1, right, if you take the derivative of this with respect to theta 1, we are simply doing the partial derivative of ex with respect to theta 1. Right? Chain rule, what comes next? Derivative of x d theta times times d theta 1. All right, that's the chain rule. Well, that's not all because we also have now the, um, the effect that is generated by changing theta 2. So if you do them both at the same time, then you need to add the partial derivative of x with respect to theta 2, d theta 2. So what are we saying here? I'm applying a small delta theta 1 and 2 and analyzing the effect it creates in the Cartesian position in the x direction. What's the other one? Well, the other one is identical, but now we do that in the y direction. Um... I then you add them up to find the final final relation. So I have it here. These are the same equations on top. Completed. And now we can write this in a matrix format. What are the inputs to our system? Are um, the variations of theta 1 and the theta 2. And the outputs are the, the um, resulting variation in the tip position in the x and y direction. So if I write this in a matrix form, I can simply have dEx, dE, um, dYe, like that. This has a matrix in it. And then on the other side here, we have d theta 1, d theta 2. Yeah, or, in other, or in other words, like that. If you call that a big vector here, dx, and then the d uh, theta 1, theta 2, just dq. Q, to, to, um, q means the variable we are controlling. What is j? Well, j is what goes in the, in the uh, red part there which are these partial derivatives. All right, so basically take these four partial derivatives, move them there, so j would look like this. Now when you multiply j by d theta 1, d theta 2, we get expressions for dx e, dy e. Does that make sense? Yeah? So what is j? j is what we're going to call the Jacobian matrix that relates displacements. Uh, it's the uh, changes in displacement of joints to changes in displacement in the Cartesian position, in this case, of the robot. Okay, so we're going to use this throughout the class. So look at the, look at the form of the Jacobian here. We have two degrees of freedom. 
So you take the first degree of freedom here and you take the partial derivative with respect to all uh, action, all joints that you can control. Same with the second one and so on. Should they have a third degree of freedom? Let's say the, the robot could also move in the, y, in the um, z direction. Then we would have a third line. It would be the partial derivatives of z. And you would have a third actuator. So we would have another column here. That it would now have the derivative of all the degrees of freedom with respect to that new actuation variable. Right, and so on. So we will have n times m where n is the number of degrees of freedom the robot can move, and m is the number of actuation points that you have in the robot. In this case here is a 2 by 2 because you have 2 degrees of freedom and 2 things that you can control. Okay. Let's do, let's do this guy here. So, Let's, let's uh, find the Jacobian for this guy now relating the speed or the small displacement in terms of angular position to the displacement that that creates in terms of Cartesian position. If we make that a delta theta is small enough over time, then you're talking about the derivative of position and therefore the speed in angular to the speed in Cartesian position. So what is the Jacobian here? We have two degrees of freedom, x and y, and you have three, two variables, theta 1 and theta 2. So the first line of the Jacobian is the partial derivatives of the first degree of freedom with respect to all actuation variables. So the first one there is the partial derivative of e with respect to theta 1. And what is that? Cosine becomes minus sine minus L1 sine of 1. It's the second one there, minus L2 sine of theta 1, 2. Yeah? And then the second cell is the same, but now take, taking with respect to theta 2. What's the partial derivative of this with respect to theta 2? Zero and the other one is minus L two sine of theta one two. Yeah, so this is the partial derivative of x with respect to theta one, and this is the partial derivative of x with respect to theta two. Very good. Are we assuming that the theta values are constant? No, those are variables. But we would do here partial derivative. So the, part, the derivative of this, let's say with respect to theta 1, is the derivative of cosine, negative sine, times the derivative of theta 1 plus theta 2 with respect to theta 1, which is 1. Right, so we always continue in the chain, but in this case, it's just, just 1. What's the second line? Second line is the partial derivatives of y. First one with respect to theta 1, what do we get? L1 cosine of theta 1 plus L2 cosine of uh, theta 1 plus theta 2. And the other one is the partial derivative of y with respect to theta 2, which is, this is 0. And that one becomes L2, L2, cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2. So, the first, like the first row, the L2 sine of theta 1, 2, is it like theta 1 plus theta 2? Okay, so that's now the Jacobian relating speed and speed. Now notice something important here. The points and the cells in this Jacobian are functions of theta. That means that depending on where the robot is positioned, the effect of changing the, the, uh, applying a speed to a given joint 
will create a, um, a different speed at the end effector and that will strongly depend on how the robot is oriented. Right? So the relation in the speed between the end effector and the joints that strongly depends on the robot's uh, pose, right? Where, how it is oriented. Any questions here? No? All right, so if the joints are moving at velocity q dot, q dot is the vector with all actuation variables. In this case, it's composed by theta one dot and theta two dot transposed. And the vector is moving at velocity v, which is x dot, x e dot, and uh, y uh, e dot. Right? It's also a vector. Right? It's a 2D space, so we want to specify the speed, the, the velocity. We need to specify the vector. So in this case, it has a two-dimensional. Um, it's a two-dimensional vector. So here we have then the, the relation we are looking for. The derivative of x with respect to time is the Jacobian times the speed of each joint. The speed of the end effector is the Jacobian times the speed of each joint. The output here, V, is a two-dimensional vector and here is the input is also a two-dimensional vector. If this was a three-dof robot, then the speed would be expressed in Cartesian uh, coordinates with three degrees of freedom instead of two. Good? Okay, so we can take this Jacobian matrix and split that into two with G1 and uh, J1 and J2. J1 is a two by one vector, so is J2. We are forming that with two vectors. What does that, uh, what, what information does that provide to us? Well, if you look at, a, let's say, the vector formed by J2, it will give us the direction the system would move if we actuate only about theta 2. So if you, only, if you, if you hold theta 1 static, and apply a speed to theta two dot theta two, or theta two dot is non-zero. Then the robot will move in, in Cartesian space with a vector that is given by J two. Same works the other way around. If we we make uh, theta two static and you apply a, a speed to theta one dot, then J one gives the direction in which the robot moves in that particular case right so in, in other words let's let's assume that we have a, this two dot arm like that j2 gives points in the direction perpendicular to link 2 so if i only actuate my elbow you see that this the speed here is always perpendicular to my hand right so the vector in j2 is always perpendicular to the second link in this particular case how do you find j1 now J1, I'm holding my elbow static and I'm applying speed here all right, to the other joint. What should J1 be? Uh, J2 plus the... J2 is, is zero, right? Uh, theta, theta 2 is zero. But you're moving the elbow as well, right? So no, the, the elbow is not rotating this way. But you're moving the J1, so that means you're moving the elbow as well, right? So you're moving the, the end effect. These are... Uh, we are, we are looking at positions of the tooltip only, uh, speeds of the tooltip. Right, so if I move it like that, this doesn't matter. This is fixed. I'm just applying a rotation here. Right, so in which direction does it move? It moves in a direction that is perpendicular to a line that goes from my shoulder to my hand. Right, on, a, on an angle like that. Let's see uh, an example here. Let's do the robot first. So J2 gives the position, the, excuse me, it gives the direction of motion or the speed when theta one is fixed and theta two rotates. If that is the case, then the robot should move in this direction or back, right? So that vector there 
has x and y coordinates and is given by j2. In the same way, if I now fix theta2 and apply speed to theta1 here, right, the robot now becomes this line right, because this can move. So now the speed of the robot is given by j1 that is found by tracing a line from the base of the robot to the tip and then j1 is perpendicular to that. Does that make sense? Yeah? So what happens when theta1 and theta2 are both non-zero? What's the final speed? Is it a linear combination of the two vectors? That we scale up and are down right? by changing now the individual actuation, the speed of individual joints. So you see here, the total speed of the end effector is j1 q1 dot, j2 q2 dot, j3, and so on. It's a linear combination of all of them. Does that make sense? Sure. 100%. This is a very important topic. We'll come back. This is going to hunt you until the end of this class now. So yeah. if theta 1 and theta 2 are rotating in the opposite directions, there will be an effective vector? There is always going to be an effective uh, a vector. But we are scaling. So let's say this is, this is going to be it. right? Theta J1 and J2 are fixed based on the robot's orientation. Yeah. Right? So these two are constant. Now, uh, Q1 dot or Q2, Q2 dot can either be positive or negative. Yeah. Right? But we're still adding them up. We don't know what is in J. It could very well be negative as well. So there is going to be a resultant, a resultant speed uh, in a given direction. Yeah? Yes. Sorry, say that again. Is adding all is is adding all the J's together is scaled by the speed of individual joints. Scaled by the speed of individual joints. All right. So let's make things a bit more more interesting. Uh, sorry. Let's see what the Jacobian actually tells us. We know fundamentally what it's telling us is the relation between the speed, angular and uh, Cartesian speed. We know that now each column in the Jacobian provides the explicit relation between a specific joint's speed and its influence on the Cartesian speed of the end effector. So for our uh, two-dimensional robot there, these are all possible combinations that we can achieve by combining uh, J1 and J2 by combining the roles of the Jacobian. When they add up perfectly, like here, so theta1 and theta2 are 1, we can have them adding up, we can have them added like that, we can have one opposing the other, as uh, Miles suggested, right? but it's still not necessarily 0, because the uh, J1 and J J2 may not necessarily be the exact same size. And then here we have their, their possible linear combination. So anything within that, uh, um, that um, ellipsoid, any direction, any, uh, can be achieved by combining theta1 dot and theta2 dot. Okay, so so long as theta1, uh, excuse me, j1 and j2 are not collinear, let me repeat that, so long as j1 and j2 are not collinear, the robot can be moved in any arbitrary direction because it can simply scale them up or down. All right? So that's what you see here. Let's say J1 is that, J2 is pointing up. I can achieve any combination of them by now scaling individual J, J1 or Js by multiplying them by the speed that you have control of. All right? So that only works if they are not collinear. What happens if they are collinear? Well, if they are collinear, I can stretch them one way or the other way. 
but I cannot change their direction. Regardless of how much I scale them up or down, the result is always along the same line. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, so let's do an example on the board here. Let's say we have J1 like that and J2 like that. All right, what's the sum? Is this. This is the final speed. But I can multiply. Remember that these have to be multiplied by theta 1 dot and theta 2 dot. So I can scale this guy here as much as I want by simply multiplying that by theta 1 dot, by controlling the speeds of that, or, or even in the same in the other direction. Right? Which means that if I keep this one static, my speed now can be anywhere here. Does that make more sense? Yeah? yeah? So let's say J, this is the original vector. My speed was here. Now I double the size of this one by simply doubling the size this the amount of speed I apply to theta 1. What's the final speed now? Or the end effector is like that. All right. If I wanted to, to move in uh, even more in that direction, I can reduce this speed, in which case it will move like this. Yeah? Every direction, because I can also flip the direction okay. of, of them right, by reversing the speed. So this works fine so long as they are not collinear. What happens if they are collinear? Now I have theta 1, let's say j1 pointing that way. If I scale j1, in which way can I scale it? That way or this way, right? Along that line. If I have j2 pointing this way, it's the same. So the resulting vector regardless of the size of J1 or J2, will belong to this common line between them, right? So if they are collinear, they can only move in one particular direction. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that you lose control of the robot in other directions. We can only move along a certain line. And that's what we call a singular configuration. That's the singularity of the robot, and the mechademic has a bunch of them. You've probably noticed a, a mysterious error at some point. Well, it just means that you put the, you p you've probably done it, probably put the robot by accident in a singular configuration and ask it to move in a direction that it can't, right? Because of what we see here. Now, in the case of the academic, it's a much more complicated problem because you have the six of these individual J's. And the Jacobian is a six by six matrix. All right, so it's a little harder to, to see where these so singularities are. Singularity occurs when the J's are aligned. So whenever we did a singularity with the mechademic, we somehow managed to get all six J's. No, not all six, at least two of at them. Two. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, so that's uh, what a singularity means. So you're losing the ability to move in a specific direction. Um, in Cartesian space. Okay, so let's look at our example. Back to our example here. What is the determinant? Uh, sorry, let me, uh, why am I talking about the determinant? To find the singularity, it happens that the singularity will occur when the determinant of the Jacobian is zero. Easy, right? When the determinant of the Jacobian is zero, the robot is in a singular configuration. So for our Jacobian that we just calculated, what is the determinant? Is this times that minus, minus that times that, right? So what is it? It's L1 minus L1, L2, sine 1, cosine 1, 2. Minus L2 squared sine of 1, 2, cosine of 1, 2, plus L1, L2, sine 1, 2, cosine 1, plus L2 squared sine 1, 2, cosine 1, 2. OK, 
Okay, so I'm not going to go through the detail, but that's the determinant. And now if you use some trigonometric analysis, I'm going to skip that part. We can simplify this whole expression using some, some magic that I, you won't be required to figure out during the midterm to that configuration there, to, to that expression, L1, L2, sine of theta 2. How do we make that 0? How do we make that 0? Theta of 2 must be either 0 or 180. So if theta 2 is 0 or 180, the robot reaches a singular singularity because the determinant of this Jacobian is 0. Does that make sense? Well, let's look at the orientations of the robot where theta 2 is 0, which is in this case here, the robot is simply fully stretched. Right, the both both arms are fully aligned. If both arms are fully aligned, J1 and J2 point in the same direction. All right, so you can make a, an analogy again with my arm. If I have my arm fully stretched and I move and I rotate my arm around my elbow or around my shoulder, the resulting speed is in the exact same direction. Right? So this is a singular configuration because that's basically the only direction we can move along. The other configuration is 180, so this arm is folded on itself and it's the same problem, except that now J1 and J2 are opposite. Right, and if they are opposite, again, doesn't matter how much we scale them up or down, we are scaling them along the same value, which means that now we can only move along that line. Yeah. So the only purpose of the determinant is to basically verify uh, the singularity of the robot. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you want to keep the robot away from this singularity. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, how was the last step? What is the the angle here? I mean, that that means the theta should be equal to zero or the one hundred eighty. That means yes. That means that the determinant is zero. If uh, sorry. sorry it means that the determinant is zero if. Theta 2 is 0 or theta 2 is 180. Yeah? Okay? Good? All right, so we know what this Jacobian is doing. Now it's doing a mapping between the speed in the joint space, not in the joints, to the speed of the Cartesian space, the tip of the robot. So we could see how that mapping changes the speed or creates a speed in the robot by inputting or passing through the Jacobian all possible combinations of speed. That the robot can take. So if you plot here theta 1 and theta 2, and these points here are the maximum speeds of each individual joint, this maximum feasible speed of each individual joint, we can take any combination within this square. Any combination means a specific value of theta 1 and theta 2. We give that to, we pass that through the Jacobian and we see the resulting speed of the end effector. And you see that the resulting speed of the end effector is also in 2D. It's uh, x and y dot like that. And you can then plot the resulting speed in Cartesian space. So let's say we take point A. Point A gives the speed of theta 1 and theta 2. We pass that through the Jacobian of the robot and we get the equivalent Cartesian space there. This mapping only works for one specific configuration of the robot because as soon as we change 
the pose of the robot, J changes, and the mapping, again, changes. Right? So it's more common, when you look at robotics textbooks, to instead of defining the inputs in a square like that, we normalize theta 1 and theta 2 with a circle in a way that this is the, the, the radius of that circle is always 1. It's always 1. And then you pass that through the Jacobian again, and you see what is the feasible range of um, Cartesian space, speed. So if you take this point, we pass that through the Jacobian, and we plot that point, let's say here. Then this point now revolves around the circle, and you find the equivalent points on the other side, and that will give us these ellipsoids. Now notice something, if the robot is in this configuration, this is the speed ellipsoid. If you change the robot to that configuration, that's the speed ellipsoid. If it goes to that configuration, then it's a different ellipsoid. It strongly depends on, because the mapping is done by j, and remember that j is a function of theta 1 and theta 2. What happens with these ellipsoids when the robot is in a singular configuration? They become a line, right? They, you squeeze it to a line, because it can only move along a line, right? All right. Mm -hmm. So we get the, let's say we took point A. Point A says we were putting in a speed in theta 1, let's say, of 1 radians per second, speed in theta 2 of 1 radians per second. We know that the, 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 Cartesian, the Cartesian speed is J times theta dot. So we take these two theta dots, we put them here, j is a function of theta 1 and theta 2, then we get v. v is a two-dimensional vector that has x and y. And let's assume when you plot x and y speed, it, be, it falls there. So then that is the equivalent point that it gives the direction of the speed in Cartesian space. Because we don't know what J is. Um, so it's, right? it, could it could be anywhere. It really depends on J. In the same way that uh, these ellipsoids here will strongly change, well, that one also will change as soon as J changes. Right? So the uh, manipulability of the robot strongly depends on its uh, current pose. Yeah? All right, so here we have uh, some of the singularities with the Macademic robot. We have a YouTube video here that shows all of them, but I selected only a few here for us to, to look. So the first one I have on the top there, those are three singular uh, configurations where the robot cannot move in the direction of joint 5. So we have here joint 1, 2, 3, 5. So in this configuration, the robot cannot move, the tip of the robot cannot move along that line. If you want it to move along that line, you first have to reorient it and then slide it along that line. So there are three possible ways to put the robot in that position. Here are, here's another one. These three configurations, in these three configurations, the robot cannot move in the direction of joint two. So anything along the plane there is not feasible. The tip of the robot cannot move, cannot create a speed in that direction. But the problem here is a lot more complicated because you're dealing with now six degrees of freedom instead of just two that we saw before. Very good. Okay, now let's do the opposite. 
We know that by changing the speed of individual joints, we achieve a certain speed in the end effector. Let's try to do the opposite. If we want a specific speed of the end effector, what is the speed of the joints that we need to achieve that? Well, it's just the inverse of what we did. With the inverse, we move the Jacobian to the other side. We invert it, and now we have, we specify V. We specify the, the desired Cartesian speed, and we get the required joint speed. So if you do it for the robot we just saw, that's the expression we get. Do you see a problem with that? We see that that is divided by sine of theta 2. When theta 2 is 0 or 180, that goes to 0, the whole thing blows to infinity. So when the robot approaches its singularity, the ability to generate a speed in that particular direction requires more and more um, speed in the corresponding Cartesian joint to the point where it will tend to infinity because the robot approaches a singular value and cannot move along that direction. Right? So you see the problem happening mathematically right here and you can try to make sense of it if you give the robot this blue line to follow and you see the different orientations of the robot as it's, it's tr it tries to follow that line at a given uh, constant speed let's say now to give it a constant speed but I want it to move along those lines with a, at that constant speed what is the required speed of theta 1 and theta 2 to achieve that so so long as you are away from a, from a singularity this is fine this is perfectly feasible but when you approach, let's say, this point over here, where the arm now needs to be fully stretched, or this point here where the arm goes up and down, like that, and it's folded on itself when you have 180 degrees for theta 2, what happens? The speed of theta 1 and theta 2, the required speed, will blow to infinity because you're now dividing that by a very small value. But it also makes sense if you want to generate... Let's, put a, uh, let's look at this one here. I want the robot to move to that way, right? But in, in, uh, create a speed in that direction because I'm moving that way. The farther I go, the closer the robot is getting to a singular value, right? And the more I go, the uh, more straight up J2 is becoming. If I want J2 to point that way, because that's eventually the way I want to go, what I have to do? I have to scale J2 and J1 in a way that the resultant force goes that way. So I'm using basically the projection of J2 and J1 on the x-axis. But it gets to a point, then the projection is so small that the scaling factor required to move in that direction will have to blow to infinity. All right, so that so we can try to make physical sense of it, but I can also see this from the equation. Right, because eventually, again, what you're trying to do is using the projections of J1 and J2 on the direction of motion, and you're scaling J1 and J2 so that the resultant go along the direction of motion. But when J1 and J2 now tend to be orthogonal to the direction of motion, then it would require an infinite speed to get any projection on that line yeah which is also visible from the equations we developed there now we can see this uh, more explicitly if we take the Jacobian and evaluate the Jacobian in two specific points when theta is 0 and when theta is pi yeah, for theta 2 excuse me theta 2 is 0 theta 2 is pi so when the robot is here, it's just going up and down because it's tracking a point very near the origin here. Then theta 1 is 90 degrees. Theta 2 is, is, um, should be 180. This should be 180. But anyway, it does the same thing. We can see the result on J1 and J2. What can you tell from J2? That the only, this one cannot create any, direct, any speed. This one can only create a speed in X. 
uh, which should make sense because if the robot is going up and down, the tip can only move along x. Right? And if the robot is going fully stretched, it's now pointing that way, then theta 1 and theta 2 are both 0. Look at what happens here. J1 and J2 are um, only in the y direction. How do you explain the fact that a J1 is greater than J2? What is J1 doing again? It's relating the speed of theta 1 to the speed of the tip. And J2 is the speed of theta 2 to the, the speed of the tip. Why is theta 1 then greater? Because it has a bigger arm length. Right, what's the, the, uh, the speed there? Isn't it the radius times the angular speed? Right? So you can see that this also depends clearly on the configuration of the robot and the structure of the robot. Okay, yeah, so this one, just a typo here, this should have been 180. Okay, one last thing. One last thing. We can use the same structure to now find the relation between torque and force. If you look at the, the joint space, we have angular speed, and they have a torque for each joint. So if you multiply them, if you multiply the speed of each joint with the torque of each joint, what do you get? The power in each joint. When I transpose the matrix like that, it means that we're going to eventually just add everything up. Right? It's going to be a row matrix times a column matrix. So you're basically doing theta1 dot tau1, theta2 dot tau2, and so on, and then adding everything up. So that's the total power in the joint space. What happens in the Cartesian space? Well, it's the same because now instead of torque, we have a force developed at the tip. And instead of the angular position, uh, speed, we have the linear position of the tip, VE, or the end effector. Okay, so now we can establish this relation here. The torque in the joint space equal to the torque, excuse me, the power in joint space equals to the power in Cartesian space. We had an expression for V that are, uh, and we can relate V to theta. How do we do that? V is, with respect to theta dot, is J theta dot, isn't it? It's J theta dot. Yeah. So the transpose. Okay, let me do this in one step at a time. So I'm replacing the speed with j theta dot. So now I can relate this, expand this expression, and then have j theta dot all transposed times f e. The transposed of a multiplication is the same as the multiplication of the transposed. So this theta, this transpose can go on theta and on j instead. Which means that I can now cancel these two out. And you have the torque equals to the transposed of the Jacobian times the force. Interesting. So the Jacobian itself relates speed. The transpose of the Jacobian gives the relation between torque in each joint and the force exerted by the robot at the end effector. So uh, the force acting on the end effector meaning that when the uh, robot is acting the force, for example, Yes, this is the this, let's say the static force. So if you position the robot like that um, and, uh, you, and you just apply torque to each of the robot, it will apply a force to your hand that can be calculated through that. Um, the transposed 
é o DJ Cook. Ok? Any questions? No? But once again, remember, always remember that the Jacobian here changes constantly so long as, uh, as soon as the robot changes position because it's a direct function of theta 1 and theta 2 for that particular configuration, for that particular robot. Okay, so if there are no questions, let's do a few, two exercises, three, if we have time. First one, calculate the Jacobian of the cylindrical arm below. Calculate the Jacobian of the cylindrical arm below. Go ahead. What do you do first? Find the forward kinematics. So we need the, how many degrees of freedom you have here? We have uh, three, three, right? Three Cartesian positions. So we need to determine the expression for, for X, Y, and Z. Then how many actuation points we have? Also three, theta one, d, d2, and d3. So what's the size of the Jacobian? It's a three by three matrix. Okay, I'm gonna spare you the, the, uh, the trouble of finding the forward kinematics because that was covered in, an, in a past lecture. All right, so here is the transformation, the homogeneous transformation matrix. If you want to practice frame assignments and forward kinematics, you can uh, try to get here on your own later. But that's the, uh, transfer, the homogeneous transformation from frame 3 to 0. Where is x, y, and z? There. All right, that's the vector y, x, y, and z. So x, the x position of the tooltip is negative d3 sine of 1. The y position of the tooltip is d3 cosine of 1. And the z position is d2. What is the Jacobian? Let's just define the Jacobian. Is the partial derivative, what's the first row of x with respect to theta 1? Then the partial derivative of x with respect to? Theta 2. Hold on. There's no theta 2. To what now? Uh, d2. d2. And the partial derivative of x with respect to? D3. d3. Sorry. Um, d, d2. D3. Very good. What's the second row? It's the same, but now with respect to what is the derivative of y? And then lastly, the derivative of y Oh, excuse me, z with respect to theta 1, with respect to theta 2, and with respect to, uh, sorry, I, I made, the, made the same mistake now, theta d2, d3. Okay, so again, first degree of freedom, partial derivatives of all actuation variables, second and third. So what is the first row? What's the partial derivative of x with respect to theta 1? Is sine becomes cosine. So it's negative d3 cosine of 1. What's the second element? Partial derivative of x with respect to d2. What is that? Partial derivative of x with respect to d2. Zero. Zero. 
What is that saying? It's the partial derivative of x with respect to d2 is 0. So that means that a d2 cannot affect x. Very good. d2 cannot affect x. Is that the case? Yes. Yes, because d2 only controls the vertical position. Now, which here is z. Right? Said, let's put a x and y like that. What's the last one? The partial derivative of x with respect to d3 is minus sine of 1. Second row, partial derivative of y with respect to theta 1 is d3 sine of 1. Cosine is negative sine, right? Negative d3 sine of 1. What is coming next? D partial derivative of y, d2. What is that? Zero. Zero. Again, d2 cannot affect y. y can only affect z, so that makes sense to be zero. And then the last term is partial derivative of y with respect to uh, d, which is d3, which, which is c1. Last row, all partial derivatives with respect to of z. Now, what is partial derivative of z with respect to theta 1? Come on, folks, wake up. Partial derivative of z with respect to theta 1? Zero. Zero. With respect to d2? One. one. And with respect to d3, uh, zero. So this is saying that uh, d2 cannot affect, cannot be affected by theta 1 or d3. And that's exactly what it is, because it only controls the z position. Okay, okay and that's the Jacobian. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the this problem doesn't ask, but we let's find the singular configuration. What's the singularity of this this robot arm? We need to find the determinant. Right. So I'm gonna take the Jacobian we calculated here. I think that was actually exercise four that asks for the singularity. So let's move to exercise four. Yeah. That's the Jacobian we just found, isn't it? Yeah. And then let's try to find the singularity, which, in, which means the determinant of J. How do we find the determinant of a three by three? I don't know how you learned it, but I learned it to copy the first two rows over, yeah? And now we can find the determinant by multiplying that, which is zero, multiplying this, which is also zero, and multiplying that, which is negative d3 sine of 1 squared. Then minus, minus that, 0, minus this, which is plus, sorry, this is positive plus d3 cosine of 1 squared plus 0. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Let me f do a caller here that you can actually read. There. What can we do? We can simplify that, right? If you factor out D3, we have S1 squared plus cosine 1 squared, and that is, that is D3. So the determinant of J is D3. How do we make that zero? Just equate that to zero. If we equate that to zero, how is that a singularity? It can only rotate like that, right? You cannot create. Uh, speed in any other direction because we lost the arm length to do rotations like that. Okay. So you wouldn't be able, in other words, you wouldn't be able to produce a speed in which directions? X or Y. Right. You'll only be able to control it, the rotation speed like that and then the up and down, Z speed. Yeah? So the, conf the singular configuration requires D3 to be zero. So this goes away. And we are now in a point there. All right, so how do we now make the robot move in X and Y direction? We can't. Because the only way we could do that is if we had an arm length and then the base would rotate like that. But that's gone. So they can only have a speed now in D or a rotation. Yeah, we can contr still control D2, right? So D2 would create a speed in Z, but the speed in Y and X would be gone if D3 is zero. Okay, let's do quickly one more here, exercise two. It's not showing in my, um, I mean, not displaying here for some reason, that's the app I'm using, but it should be shown more clearly in your copy there. We have a three DOF, four DOF, a three DOF robot arm. Uh, one, two, three. Degrees of freedom, those are the DH parameters. We want to find the singular configurations of that that robot. So I'm giving you here the transformation matrix. And the transformation matrix, this one has a typo. I don't know if I up updated this. And bright space, the last line is missing there, but it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, sorry. That. Uh, the last, the last uh, row is missing. Okay, so if you want to find the the um, singular configuration, what's the first step? Forward kinematics, which is already given in fourteen. Then do the Jacobian. What is the Jacobian for this one? For this robot? 
how many degrees of freedom we have? X, Y, and Z. How many control variables? Three. So we have a nine element uh, Jacobian. So the first row is, let's say, X, partial derivative with, uh, with respect to theta 1, 2, and 3. So what's the first row, the first cell? Partial derivative of X, which is right here, with respect to theta 1. That is negative sine 1 and everything else remains the same then the second element is the partial derivative of x with respect to theta 2 what is that? cos 1 times a2 sine 2 negative plus or minus a3 sine of 2, 3. And the last cell there is the partial derivative of x, again in red, with respect to theta, theta, 3. So the first one here is only, the first element is only a function of theta 2, so that's 0. And then you are left with cosine 1 times a3 times sine of 2, 3, negative. What is the second one? Second line is partial derivative of y. y. With respect to theta uh, 1, that is negative c1. Sorry, no, that's just c1. Cosine 1, a2, c2, plus a2, 3, cosine 2, 3. With respect to theta 2, is S1 A2 cosine 2 negative minus S1 A3 sine 2 3 and then the last one is with respect to theta 3 that is sine 1 A3 sine 2 3 negative Yeah? Sort of? Does that make sense? So what's the last one? See if you're following. Last one is z with respect to theta 1, which is? What's the partial derivative? Zero. That means joint 1 cannot affect z. Is that the case for this robot? Joint 1? cannot affect Z. Yeah. Then the next one is Z with respect to A to theta 2 is what is that? Z with respect to theta 2. Cosine of 2 becomes negative sine of 2, so a2 sine of 2 plus a3 cos 2, 3 and then the last one is that with respect to z uh, excuse me, to theta 3, that is a3 cosine 2, 3 yes, that's the Jacobian What do we do next once we found the Jacobian? We find the determinant. Now the determinant of this Jacobian has around one, two, three, 
nine, there's around, around 50 uh, elements in it, if you multiply everything out. So, uh, of course, you don't have time to do that, right? But in the middle one, is that what you minus S1, H2, S2? Uh, this one? Th this? That one. No, no, no. Oh, my God. This is <laughs> make, a tr make a decision, Miles. The middle, the middle. The middle, yeah, here's the middle. Yeah, the middle. Minus S1, A2, that's what's on S2. Uh, that is the derivative of this with respect to theta 2. So should be, yes, should be, yeah, S2. Very good. Okay, so I'm, going to, I'm not going to do the determinant of this because it's, it's giant, and then you have to simplify it. I can post that in the, the solution later, but after simplification, that's uh, let the magic happen, and that's the determinant. Not with a three by three matrix. No. So, two by two. Two by two potentially. <laughs> yeah. Not six by six. What about the determinant of uh, one by one? Can you do that one? Now, two by two is easy. Okay, so once we do all the simplification, we get that. So how do we make that zero? To find the singular values, we want this to go to zero. How do we make that thing go to zero? Either A2 or A3 must be zero. Well, that makes, so how do we, we make that happen? Now, if A2 or A3 are zero, then you're losing an arm. <laughs> All right, but in mathematically it, it can happen so that means removing a degree of freedom from the robot All right, so we lose the first or the second arm the, the third or the second arm by making these well, right uh, yeah we can make that too so move a joint Lose a joint. So another option is to make S3 0. So when sine of 3 is 0, what happens? Or 180 degrees, right? Or 180 degrees. Let's look at the robot. When that is 0, the, the arm is fully stretched. And when the arm is fully stretched, we run into the same problem we had for the 2 DOF system before. All right, so this one means the arm is stretched and then the last option this is not as trivial is to make the other part zero a2 c2 plus a3 c2 3 equal to zero so what do, what does that mean physically if you look at the robot let's look at the robot here What is this is theta 2, this is theta 3, this is a2, this is a3. This is our x-axis, y and z. So what is a2 cosine of theta 2? Is the projection of arm 2 on x. Is a2 cosine of theta 2 is the projection of arm 2 on x. Is that clear? H3 cosine of theta 2 plus theta 3 is the projection of arm 3 on the x-axis. So when you have A2 cosine of 2 plus A3 cosine of 2, 3 equals to 0, what you are saying is I want the projection of both uh, arms 2 and 3 on x to be 0. In which configuration is the robot? either straight up or facing straight down and again we run into the same problem all right so that a last condition means that the projections of this for the second and third arm of the robot on x becomes zero so the robot is straight up or straight down and then we lose the ability to move in uh, in z First of all, 
right? We cannot move up or down anymore and in another Cartesian direction. 